I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Ghostland. And this is All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, August 27th. We got lots of fun stuff and perhaps a clip will be found and restored <laughs> and shared. But until then, let's have some international headlines, shall we? Homophobia seen rising in European countries without gay marriage. The third annual Queer Olympics to be held in Istanbul was canceled by authorities at the last minute because of social sensitivities. The Palestinian Authority police ban a Palestinian LGBT group from holding activities in the West Bank. Asylum seeker told by judge that he was not effeminate enough to be gay. This is a little UK series I have planned. I am transgender, a Guardian football writer, um, comes out on Twitter. I have that to show you. The 1975's Matt Healy protests against Dubai anti-gay laws with a kiss. Another kiss this, <laughs> that's a going trend in the entertainment industry, apparently. Um, Russian LGBT activists urge government to investigate the gay hunting site, which I've reported on before. Gay parents flee Russia with their kids because the authorities could, would take the children away. Stories I may not get to, um, Cuba prevents an LGBTIA activist from tra traveling to the US. And I have a picture before you of him. His name is Leandro Rodriguez Garcia. He was treated horribly at the Jose Marti airport and couldn't get out of the country. Berlin Memorial to gay victims of Nazis is vandalized. Uh, and what happened is there was a, there were windows that you could look to to see a gay couple kissing and the windows were painted over. They were blackened. Um, Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro, who is much in the news these days, he slashed funding for LGBT films and screenplays. That's and he amazing. also is not accepting the money from the G7 too. It's just horrible. Yeah, I mean, Finally, bad news, China's parliament rules out allowing same-sex marriage, so it's not going to follow in the footsteps of Taiwan anytime soon. So those are my headlines, a All mixed right. bag. They sounds good, but no penguins? Or no penguins no, okay. this time. Right. I'm watching, though, with 55 <laughs> days yeah. gestation yeah. period. Yeah. That's right. Trump administration to the Supreme Court. David Koch, whose billionaire status was used against LGBTQ people, has died at 79. Actor and writer radio host L.Z. Granderson represents a new generation of enlightened journalists. Catholic priest arrested for giving parish money to men on Grindr. John Lewis, the homophobic and misogynist former radio jock from Minnesota. John Lewis? Jason Lewis. Yeah, Sorry. John Lewis is That's the civil rights yeah, icon. No, yes. Linda, for heaven's so, sake. I, I thought we were going to have a momentous coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Lewis, the homophobic and misogynist former radio jock from Minnesota who lost his bid for the U.S. House to a lesbian, now wants to be the state's senator. His latest comment was a complaint about how he can't call women sluts. Indiana teen was attacked in the locker room. Mm. <laughs> okay. I know. Uh, Kim Davis may have to pay thousands of dollars to couples she wouldn't give a marriage license to. What don't, a shame. Yeah, yeah, don't take a personal check. Uh, I know. <laughs> California, straight pride has 20 people and 200 counter protesters. Yes. You like that. Republican congressman slams trans people in a new campaign ad. Hate crime is rocketing, skyrocketing, <coughs> and Trump's appointees aren't prosecuting them. Uh, in D.C., hate crimes have doubled. 
but the number of hate crimes prosecuted is nearly zero. It is zero. Uh, the key reasons is the U.S. Attorney, Jesse Liu, a Trump appointee, refuses to prosecute these cases. Les this is a good one. Lesbian astronaut may have committed, com committed Earth's first space crime. I didn't realize she was a lesbian. Yes. Black trans woman is suing Circle K for discrimination. And the Methodists are getting a divorce. Uh-huh. I know. Epstein had a bizarre picture of Bill Clinton in a dress. And um, are you going to show that I'm going to tell the story first, and okay. then I'll show the clip. Um, the executive director of the conservative LGBTQ organization, Log Cabin Republican, resigns. So... Local news. <laughs> and, and some of the local news is going to hinge on some of the things that Linda's going to talk about nationally. But first, yesterday, August 26th, Happy Women's Equality Day. Oh, I thought it was Dog Day. Happy Women's <laughs> Equality Day. <laughs> Thank Ten you. Tennessee on <laughs> August 18th, 1920 was the two-third needed state ratification. But then they had to get the notarized <coughs> document by train to Washington, D.C., so it wasn't signed by the Secretary of State until August 26th. Oh. And don't get any ideas for next year being the 100th anniversary <laughs> of the 19th Amendment. I wouldn't think of it. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> I know. A march or a rally, maybe. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about the 45 regime and their amicus brief that they filed with the U.S. Supreme Court mm -hmm. in those labor cases that are LGBTQ specific, and why we here in Vermont should be paying attention in the action that we should be taking. And following up on District of Columbia and their 178 cases. Yep. In 2017, only two were prosecuted as hate crimes, and both of them were dropped as part of a plea bargain. So then we're going to talk about, okay, hate crimes, Vermont, anything we should be paying attention to? Ottawa, uh. talking about your Pride Day, Mayor Jim Watson, after 30 years of public service, quote, I just said it. Well, I just wrote it. He came out in an op-ed piece in the Ottawa Citizen. He said he had always been a shy and lonely kid. His family may have suspected, but they never talked about it. And Zach's <clears throat> going to have a picture of you with him having fun, like a squirt gun fight <laughs> in the Pride Day Parade in Ottawa. And. Vermont's Pride Day is Sunday, September 8th, Burlington, and as you said, California. Oh, only 20 Aww. people for their Pride Day. We're going to talk a little bit about the Democrats and recent polling and why we may be watching this a little more closely and looking at the upcoming legislative session. Several groups, Interfaith Action has already said they are going to come back and heavily supporting $15 an hour minimum wage. The Democrats have said they're going to come back in and they want to talk about waiting period on the purchase of a handgun. California has a new statute restricting the use of lethal force. Vermont is already saying we really want to look at it. Within six months from 2017 to 2018, there were six cases of lethal force in Vermont. Mm -hmm. All of them were deemed to be justified. Hmm. So, what's happening? Um, Catholic Diocese, they finally released their report. We reported on the last show. They were hesitant. They listed 40 priests with credible allegations starting in 1915. Twelve of them. 1915 served, or 50? 1950. 50? Oh, okay. I'm sorry, 1950. Twelve of them served in parishes here in central Vermont. And most of them are dead, no doubt. Twelve of them served in parish. In the re actual report, it does tell you if the, if the priest is still living okay. and if they still have not been defunct. This week's trivia question. 
1986, decision by the U.S. Supreme Court was deemed a major setback in LGBTQ civil rights, but it was also deemed to have absolutely no impact on Vermont. What was the decision and why didn't it affect us? Oh, we have so much to cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with homophobia rising in European countries without gay marriage. Um, acceptance of gay and lesbian peoples has jumped in states where they can marry. Um, most European countries saw a rise in the acceptance of same-sex relations between 2002 and 2016, according to Hungarian researchers. However, Russia, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine all saw acceptance of gay and lesbian people decrease over a 14-year period. It's a very serious message that you can learn to be open-minded and you can learn to be intolerant, a researcher told Reuters. Same-sex marriage is legal in 16 out of 48 European countries, while 21 European countries do not allow same-sex marriage or civil partnerships. The European Social Survey asked participants to rate their agreement with the statement, gay men and lesbians should be free to live up their own life as they wish on a scale of one to five. I bet we can guess some of these numbers. Russia <laughs> scored the lowest in 2016 with an average of two. And the highest <laughs> scores came from Belgium, Spain, Norway, France, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Iceland. Spain and Portugal, where gay marriage is legal, and Cyprus, Italy, and Greece, which allows same-sex civil partnerships, so the biggest positive changes according to the analysis. So nothing surprising there, really. Um, the study originated in Hungary. One of the researchers said, you can see how, for example, in my country, the Orban regime organizes this propaganda message about migrants or against gays and lesbians, and it works. Orban opposes equal rights for same-sex couples while also advocating for gay and straight people to coexist quietly, a contradictory message there. Um, in Hungary, you can have a civil partnership, but you can't marry or jointly adopt a child. So, uh, Istanbul is blazing a nefarious trail. Uh, the third annual Queer Olympics uh, was canceled um, by authorities at the last minute, as I said, because of social sensitivities. Organizers say when they arrived to set up, they were met by riot control vehicles. Um, so they didn't know ahead of time? That no, they because it. they didn't want them to appeal. Okay. And one of the um, activists said they had all year to do this, but they sprung it at the last minute, so there was no recourse. Um, and also in Istanbul, you may recall, the um, Pride Parade was banned, but marchers marched anyway, even though tear gas was thrown at them by the police. So all of this demonstrates one thing the activists say, these bans aim to function to oppress us, not only physically but psychologically, to ignore our voluntary effort and to re reject our existence. So bad news from Turkey. Also bad news from Palestine. Um, there is a Palestinian LGBT group that has been operating in and around the region and uh, it's been banned from organizing any activities in the West Bank. Uh, the Palestinian Authority has threatened to arrest them, saying such activities are contrary to the values of Palestinian society. Police spokesman said events such as those organized by the group Al Cause, that's the name of it, go against and infringe upon higher principles and values of Palestinian society. Uh, the police chief argued that, uh, the police spokesperson argued that specific, s suspicious parties were trying to sow discord and undermine Palestinian society's peaceful state of affairs. He asserted that the police would pursue Al-Qaeda's staff 
and turn them over to judicial authorities if it successfully collars them. He called on Palestinians to report on any all-cause all -cause activity promising uh, informers confidentiality. Al-Cause is a non-governmental organization established in 2001 that aims to support gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender Palestinians and Arab Israelis. Its website says it has offices in East Jerusalem and Haifa. Palestinian Authority security forces cannot enter those areas according to agreements between Israel and the PLO. While there are no Palestinian Authority laws on the books that ban homosexual acts, the Palestinian LGBT community largely exists underground. Um, al Qaus condemned the police statement, said that um, this... al Qaus is their group. Is the LGBT okay. Palestinian group, al Qaus. Um, threats of violence, this is a new low, they say. So I can finish or I could continue? Finish with... Can I finish with Palestine? Uh-huh. Okay, despite the Palestinian Authority's police statement, the group will continue to work in different areas of Palestine while taking into account the generally loaded atmosphere because of media outlets and the police's incitement so that we do not put any of our activists and friends at risk. Um, it rises to the level of calling for community violence and inciting a crime, this police uh, statement. Many understood it as a call to wastefully spill blood and take the law into one's hands by implementing killing operations. This is not how issues are handled. This is not how the police protect their citizens, the activist added. Yeah, that's, so that's very, very sad problematic. considering what's going on there already. Yeah. <coughs> And speaking of what's already going on. Yes. <laughs> Actor and writer, radio host, L.Z. Grandison represents a new generation of enlightened journalists. I have a picture of him. The 47-year-old Detroit native has written for CNN, ESPN, and ABC. He's also a gay man blazing through the traditionally heterosexual industry of sports. So we have his picture. Catholic peace priest arrested for giving parish money to men on Grinder. This New Jersey Monsignor is also accused. Oh, he's a Monsignor. Yeah. Ooh. I know. Is also accused of using the money to pay for a beach house on the New Jersey shore. <coughs> We're not talking pocket change. No. Yet. Or, or <laughs> donations from We're them. talking $100,000. Of parish donations. Joseph McLean has been under investigation for over a year and was arrested and charged with 18 criminal counts. So, big spender. I Indiana teen was attacked in his locker room. Wow. Students circulated a video on the incident around the school. The teenager's mother shared the story with an Indianapolis TV station, WTHR. The video shows the victim and the attacker um, is beating him on the head. The teenage boys say that he is used, this teenage boy says that he's used to being ridiculed and attacked at school, which is a very sad commentary, but he's getting through it. It's been going on for years. Parents of the victim says the two perpetrators of the attack have been expelled and police are looking into the incident. So hopefully something will come of that. Where in Indiana? Indianapolis. Mm. The right wing is ecstatic with Trump's religious freedom record on LGBTQ issues. He is the best president in modern history, <coughs> says Matt Staver founder and chairman of the Liberty Council. The Liberty Council is, as we know, considered a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And then we have Kim Davis. A federal, 
<gasps> a federal court ruled that former Kentucky clerk Kim, Kim Davis can be sued as an individual for denying marriage licenses into licenses to two couples. On the same day, another court found that the state of Kentucky is on the hook for legal fees that um, the gay couples have um, mounted Incurred. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while suing. So that's good news there. Now we can get Mitch McConnell out and it will be a home run in Kentucky. Russian Mitch? No. Moscow Mitch. Moscow Mitch, right. Republican congressman slams trans people in new campaign ad. Ralph Abraham is running for governor of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he hopes the cultural wars will win him the office. He touts his love for Trump. The truth, he says, is I'm a doctor. And I can assure you there are only two <laughs> genders. <laughs> he oh. describes himself as a conservative Christian voice. So, on that note, we'll I'm move. glad we're not going to Louisiana <laughs> for health care, all I'm going to say. Uh, and it's hurricane season, too. <sighs> As Linda alluded <laughs> in her headlines, the 45 regime has filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court. And there's a great deal of concern about how this conservative court might rule on those labor cases specific to LGBTQ sexual orientation, gender identity being included under Title VII. One was a skydiver, right, and one was a social worker. Yes. Okay. So in Vermont, there were a number of constitutional amendments that were introduced last year. The one that we really need to advocate for is Proposition 4. And what this will do, I mean, people have been heralding this as Vermont's Equal Rights Amendment. Well, it does so much more than that. It takes all of what are traditionally deemed suspected classes and moves them to the constitutional level for protection. It will include race, ethnicity, sex, religion, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and national origin. Regardless of what the U.S. Supreme Court or the Congress could do in the future, if this is in the Vermont Constitution, we're protected. So we have a real investment in seeing that mm -hmm. this happens this year. <clears throat> you talked about D.C. and how their federal attorney is not prosecuting or they're plea bargaining it out. Here in Vermont, we seem to have forgotten that we had two hate crimes bills that stalled during the session. Right. <clears throat> One would prohibit conduct motivated by bias and create a civil penalty for repeated harassment. Think of the incident in Bennington where the person repeatedly showed up at events, <coughs> repeatedly sent messages, mm -hmm. clearly are hate or bias motivated to it. The other bill expands the authority of the Attorney General to investigate and prosecute. And again, thinking about Bennington where the local police didn't pursue complaints. Right. You know, what actually is already in place with the Vermont's Office of Attorney General and the Civil Rights Enforcement Division is they're asking all the municipalities to tell them when something happens. They have put a policy and a proactive approach in place already. What this is also going to do is create a task force to create uniform reporting practices, which means you've got to report it. These are the categories that you have to identify. You cannot use a default setting and that all law enforcement might need to play in the game. And that on an annual basis, the Office of Attorney General has to report to the legislature what they've investigated, what's mm -hmm. happening with those cases, and what the outcomes were. And connected to that, there is a conversation that's happening with a small group of activists from within the queer community with the Civil Rights Enforcement Division of the Office of Attorney General looking at a ban on the use of gay or trans panic defenses. And we've kind of talked about this before. 
as that's been banned in some states like New York. Yeah. Well, New York has done it. Massachusetts may be about to do it. Uh -huh. Maine just did it. Yep. I reported on it on our last show. New Hampshire's talking about it. So we're kind of sitting here saying, so what are we doing? And there might be some movement from within the community to reach out to legislators saying, so what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something that we're going to be watching. So now you're oh, going to take you know. me back to one of those deplorable places. Well, we're going to England. Oh, which okay, that's kind of these days. Mixed review. Yeah. Mixed review. Let's talk about the asylum seeker who was told by the judge he was not effeminate enough to be gay. He was seeking asylum in the UK because of his sexuality. Yeah. His case is going to be retried after the judge wrongly ruled that he was not oh, effeminate geez. enough to be gay. The, his barrister has claimed. You need me as a stand-in. <laughs> the man who can't be named due to the anonymity of the order was told by an appeal judge that he did not have a gay demeanor and did not look around the room in an effeminate manner. He says, um, and this uh, advocate Rohana Bhopal has been reporting on it, she says she routinely comes across cases where asylum seekers have been refused by the Home Office due to absurd reasons to refute their sexuality and that these then went on to be upheld by judges at the appeal stage. The so they're kind of saying, you know, like, you're faking it, so when you just to get into the country is yeah. what they're saying, basically. Yeah. Okay. The system has definitely become harsher in recent years. The quality of decision-making has been reduced, I would say so. <laughs> You come across decisions that are generally absurd. You think, how did anyone write this, she continued. One that comes up a lot is when they say to gay Muslim men that being gay is unacceptable in Islam and therefore it's implausible that they can be gay and Muslim. <laughs> or when they say to a woman who was previously in, a, in an arranged marriage with a man that she therefore cannot be gay. Leela, We've got people to introduce them to. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. Leela Sade, an executive director of the UK LGBT immigration group, said this is not an isolated incident with this man being rejected for not being feminine enough to be gay. Um, she cited other cases where judges have refused to believe people's sexual orientation because of their hairstyles, <laughs> their sexual behavior, or their religious beliefs. The biggest challenge facing LGBTQIA plus people in need of international protection is proving their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or sex characteristics, she said. This comes after a study by academics at the University of Bristol found that LGBTQ plus refugees were more likely to have their asylum applications accepted if they acted according to flamboyant stereotypes. <gasps> You'd make it, honey. In, oh, honey. <laughs> I know it, and fit into Western notions of queer gay lifestyles, such as going to pride marches or visiting gay bars. Official figures published last November revealed that the proportion of LGBT plus asylum claims rejected by the Home Office had surged in recent years, with 78% of such claims refused in 2017, a 52% rise in two years. Of the claimants who appealed their negative decisions, of which there were 2,908 between 2015 and 2017. More than two-thirds had their rejections overturned. Um, <coughs> so Ms. Bhopal says they're under intense pressure in a hostile environment. When the Home Office makes these decisions, it's people's lives they're playing with. It's damaging and dangerous. They should be doing this with great care, but they're not in the Home I'm surprised Office. they haven't had. They don't have people going around following them with cameras to see. Right. Well, I was going to say there's the story that was just breaking about the TSA here that people who identify as transgender coercing them into you have to display your genitals yeah. to prove that. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean yeah. that. Yeah. 
So now I have yeah. better news from the UK. I am transgender. Guardian football writer Nikki <laughs> Bendini comes out on a Twitter video. I'd like to show that to you now. Okay, so I guess this is a coming out video. Um, my name is Nikki Bandini. You may have known me previously as Paolo Bandini because that is the name that I have worked under for the past 13 years as a journalist. Um, I am transgender. Uh, I came out in my private life about that a little while ago, but uh, now I guess I'm coming out in my public life, if you want to call it that, as a journalist as well. Um, I've written a piece for The Guardian today about being transgender, about my personal journey, so if that's something that you do want to know more about, that's the place to find it. Um, I will link to that piece in the same tweet where I post this video. Um, but otherwise, I guess the thing that you need to know is that nothing much changes in terms of my work. I am still going to be covering Italian football, European football, and hopefully a bit of NFL this season as I have in the past. Um, and you can still get all of that good content on all the regular channels. Um, and uh, I just wanted to use this video to have a chance to get over that, I guess, initial awkwardness that perhaps some people are going to have about the fact that I look different and maybe sound a little bit different. Um, but as I say, everything else is much the same and I'm really looking forward to getting into this new season. So, good for her. I'm still a sports writer, she says, as you just saw in the clip. Another clip is coming up, <laughs> head over heels after the first one. Um, the 1975s, which is a group from uh, Chelsea, I think. No, Cheshire. It's a Cheshire band. Uh, their Matt Healy protests against the Dubai anti-gay laws with a kiss. I can't show you the kiss, but I can show you a billboard report on it. So let's take a look at that now. The 1975's Maddie Healy protested against Dubai's anti-gay laws during their recent performance on Wednesday night, and he did it in the most bold way, with a kiss. During the band's first ever gig in the United Arab Emirates, Healy went down into the crowd to greet a male fan who reportedly shouted, marry me. Healy then gave the man a hug and asked if he would also like a kiss, right before laying one on his lips. Now the kiss broke the strict anti-LGBTQ laws in the nation where homosexuality is illegal and punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Now, in the fan-posted footage that has been making its way around the internet, Healy is seen kissing the man and then reminding the crowd, we're all human, right? After the show, Matt tweeted, thank you, Dubai, you were so amazing. I don't think we'll be allowed back due to my behavior, but know that I love you and I wouldn't have done anything differently given the chance again. But who knows, maybe they'll let me back in. Let's just wait and see. This isn't the first time the 1975 have openly expressed their politics. Last year, the band donated funds to help open London's first LGBTQ center, and Healy targeted male misogynists in an acceptance speech at this year's Brit Awards. For more on this story, you can head to billboard.com. And until next time for Billboard News, I'm Chelsea Briggs, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Okay. They've been very well received in the UK. They, uh, 1975 um, has won many awards. Um, they um, won the best British group and the best album at this year's Brit Awards, and all three of their studio albums have gone to number one in the UK. Last year, the 30-year-old singer Matt Healy uh, helped to finance a new LGBT community center in London uh, telling the observer, you might wonder why it is still needed, and even ask yourself what exactly everyone is still scared of. But sadly, I think stigma still exists, even in London, and we still have some way to go, I would say so, given the <laughs> behavior of the Home Office. Uh, there have been reports of people being punished for homosexuality in the UAE, which is where this kiss occurred. Uh, particularly where there's a public element or the behavior has caused offense. There have been also several arrests for heterosexual kissing in public. The socially conscious band, who will headline the Reading and Leeds Festival next week, 
features a 16-year-old climate change activist, Greta Thunberg, on the first track of their forthcoming fourth album, Notes on a Conditional Form, which is going to be out next February. So that's what's new in the UK. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? About? about I'd like to show you a picture of the Russian gay parents who have had to flee yeah. Russia because yeah. of their um, children, you know, threatened. It was fairly obvious that they were going to be taken away from them. Their picture and the kids are blacked out, but uh, Andrei Vagovnev and Yevgeny Yerfeyev uh, have now removed their children and themselves from Russia. And where have they gone? It doesn't say. Okay. We, yeah. You wouldn't want to say. Canada. Right? Exactly. Okay. Okay, that's it for me. All right. For right now. Okay. Um, and we have the lesbian astronaut who may have committed, com committed Earth's first space crime. Yeah, Tell us this. everything. Anne McLean has been accused of assessing the bank account of her estranged ex. Accessing it. Summer Warden from outer space. So she accessed it? Yes. While, okay, she, that, was, while that, she was on the moon thing or whatever, what is that, the space, space station. station. Okay, that's one hell of a Wi-Fi. That's all, <laughs> yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Zach, we want that set up. So did she take any money or did she no. look at the account? McLean lawyer says that she did nothing wrong as she used the password and didn't take any money and didn't transfer any money. And her lawyers claim that McLean says that she just wanted to make sure her ex had enough money in the account to pay rent and take care of their children. So we'll have more reporting on that, I guess, as it goes on. Hmm. A black trans woman is suing Circle K for discrimination. Julie Brown says she was subjected to transphobic and racial harassment at a store in Illinois. I don't know what city. Hmm. So. And we have, um, oh, this is kind of interesting. Epstein, Ugh, uh, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey, had a bizarre picture of Bill Clinton in a dress at his apartment. It was hanging up prominently, and you could see it as soon as you walked into his mansion. Apparently, the artist, Patrina Ryan Keeled, a grad student, had no idea her painting ended up in Epstein's mansion, which was sold at a charity auction. She also painted one of President Bush, of which I didn't see. We don't know where that is. The painting of Clinton was called Paring Bill, and the blue dress is supposedly a symbol of what Monica Lewinsky was wearing on that infamous night. Oh, and yeah. here is a picture of Bill in the dress. It wasn't the, the night, it was an afternoon, but okay. Yeah. That was so strange. This whole thing is very yeah. strange, isn't right. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the executive director of the conservative LGB organization, Log Cabin Republicans, yeah. resigns following the group's endorsement of Trump's 2020 election bid. Jerry Anne Henry was the first woman to lead the organization, and Henry is the second high-profile member to depart. L's, uh, Log Cabin Chairman um, Robert Cabell and Vice Chairwoman Jill Holman endorsed Trump and um, so the log cabin. Sounds like Vermont's Republican Party. I, I heard that there are like 20 people in the log cabin Republicans. Really? That's what I heard. Only it's if you use mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. And then I have a picture for, for my last little bit here. Uh, Taylor Swift wouldn't perform at the VMAs unless her drag queens received awards too. So here's a picture of all of them together, so. Video Music Awards? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, can I, yes. can I just add to the Taylor Twift, Swift 
You may. Uh, story. You can her, say whatever you want. Her clip become just won the mu um, big music award. Right. Well, right. and she was insisting that everyone who had participated in the video was also recognized. Right. So oh, she had them on. Clear. They oh, had them that's on. Clear. So yeah. they had them on stage. We'll so here's the picture. Thank I you. mean, of them. About lethal force. Traditional standard is reasonably believed that your life was in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. They changed it to only when necessary and no other option. This is what? For the police to lethal respond? Force. In, lethal force. With in lethal Vermont. Use of lethal, no, this no, is in California. California. In California, okay. And what <laughs> they, yeah. follow along. <laughs> They were setting a whole new standard mm -hmm. of saying, okay, we're <clears throat> approaching this from an entirely incorrect perspective. We need to be more deliberative about what it is that we're saying is or is not permissible. And the sort of, oh, I reasonably believe that my life was in danger is kind of a very broad mm -hmm. and saying Incredibly broad. He put the, his hand in, my, in his pocket, um, you know, right. whatever. He, he so was I coming on to me. I didn't know what to do, so of course I had to kill him. Mm -hmm. So changing it to only when necessary, no other option is what else have you tried to do? Right. What are the other methods of de-escalation? If you think of incidents recently in Montpelier, right. mm -hmm. this would be a standard that Needs we might be. like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, looking at what I'm calling the Bernie Watch. Oh, I know, isn't it? Did exciting? you see this? Yeah. The latest Democratic National Committee poll, Monmouth University. Bernie got 20%. Elizabeth Warren 20%. got 20%. Joe Biden got 19. 19. Yes. Bernie had increased by six, Elizabeth by five, and Biden lost 13 points. And Kamala Harris and Mayor Pete, they're hovering around four or five percent, sort of, you know, on the second tier. So this kind of looks like the four that might end up at least. This is a huge shift. Mm -hmm. And an indication that the Democratic Party may not just be business as usual. Yep. They may be looking for something different. Although they did turn That's down the exciting. climate debate. Yes. The, 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 an official debate, right. but I believe that there were some politicians who were trying to organize some on their own, sort of yeah, in, but that in was reaction a black mark to. For the yeah, PNC, that's not. I think. Yeah. But one of the things in Vermont, and, and a lot of what I've done is looked at the federal and then said Vermont's response or how Vermont is you know, not following along, our legislature, in a great degree of forethought, appropriated the necessary $759,000 so that we would continue the funding to Planned Parenthood, which is Vermont's only family planning services in Barry. and what well they're statewide yeah what the 45 regime seems to miss is that none of the federal money were used for abortion services it went for screening contraceptive std treatment basic health care so so and again as we get nearer to the legislative session we're going to want to be following, yep. you know, what are the monies and how are they being dedicated to ensure that services still are being provided. Yep. So I'm told that we may have a, a book, book review. review. That's right. Now, from esteemed Professor Charles, who may share her thoughts with some very prestigious literary journals. <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda is going to hold this book before you. This appeared in um, this appeared in, in the August sixth issue of the Lambda Literary Review, 
a very prestigious. Is that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you want me to hold it? Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> the book, I have tiny print here. Uh, the book is entitled Valerie, a Novel, or The Faculty of Dreams. Um, there's another subtitle, Amendment to the Theory of Sexuality. It's been, it was written by Sara Svigbjerg. That is the Swedish. I've been practicing it. Um, first published in Sweden in 2006, now retitled and translated into English, Valerie, a novel, transports readers into the disturbing world of Valerie Solanus, the firebrand author of the Scum Manifesto, who captured the public eye by attempting to assassinate pop artist Andy Warhol in 1968. Remember that? Yes. Describing her work as a literary fantasy, Sarah Striesberg establishes at the outset that her book is a work of fiction, that she has taken liberties with the geography of the U.S. and with her depictions of Solanus herself. Nevertheless, the outlines of the novel include actual experiences, Solanus's childhood rapes by her biological father and dislike of her stepfather, her period of study at the University of Maryland Psychology Department, <clears throat> and a New York interval involving a sojourn at the famous Chelsea Hotel, punctuated by interactions at Warhol's The Factory and culminating in the shooting of the artist. Other scenes occur in real settings, like the Elmhurst Psychiatric Hospital, the New York State Prison for Women, the nightclub Max's Kansas City, the courtroom of the Manhattan Criminal Court, where the attempted murder case was heard, and finally, the Bristol Hotel in the San Francisco's Tenderloin District, where Solanus died in 1988 at the age of 52. These biographical and physical reference points guide the reader through a highly experimental narrative that justifies Streisberg's assertion that her work is imaginary. Loosely structured into five parts, the novel is comprised of a series of short chapters identified by time and place and employing a range of expressive modes the most common of which is stage dialogue, but also including interviews, court transcriptions, and medical reports. Invented characters mingle with actual figures. Historical people are disguised and satirized. The reader is regularly challenged to identify speakers, to decipher meaning, and to locate action. Yet despite deliberative narrative disjunction, thematic significances emerge. One compelling thread occurs during the Bristol Hotel sequences as an unnamed narrator, presumably the author, interacts with the Valerie character during the final days of the activist's life. Verbal sparring between the two characters addresses matters of art, mortality, and community. Significantly, at the end of their encounter, the narrator asks Valley, Valerie about her motives for the shooting that irrevocably altered her life. But even as she approaches imminent death, Valerie says she doesn't know why she shot Warhol. Not surprisingly, the novel resists pat answers and easy conclusions. Various versions of the shooting itself are reenacted throughout, but possibly the most heartbreaking account takes place in a dreamlike sequence toward the end of the novel in which several voices implore Valerie not to pull the trigger. One unidentified speaker presciently warns, the moment you shoot Andy Warhol, you throw away all possibility of being someone other people listen to. The only thing you dream about, the writer, artist, revolutionary, psychoanalyst, rebel. The passage concludes, and here I'm quoting of course, in a few years time, the women's movement will move into universities and everywhere women's cafes will appear, 
reading circles, feminist groups, and in San Francisco, half a million women will demonstrate dressed in white to protest against sexual politics based on fear and systematic rape. A radical women's movement will grow up and radical, a radical sexual politics. There will be a place for you there, Valerie. The new age will be your age. But as we all know, Valerie Solanas did pull the trigger and in so doing consigned herself to a life on the sidelines of prison, mental hospitals, homelessness, and obscurity. Andy Warhol is also reported to never have recovered fully from his injuries. The final pages of the novel explore in gritty detail the last days of the Valerie Solanas character's life. Streetsbear makes much of the fact that the polemicist died alone, incorporating a movingly ironic chapter entitled On the Side of the Alphabet that lists alphabetically arranged directives on how someone can be comforted who is dying. One of these directives, hold her hands, talk to her, soon she will be gone, for example. It must be said that Valerie, a novel, is not for the faint of heart or the squeamish. Dead animals appear with some frequency, especially in the laboratory park and the ocean sections. Evocations of bodily functions recur, including references to excrement, urine, vomit, and unsavory secretions. Vulgar language proliferates and violence occurs. And some readers may be daunted by the nonlinear structure and certain narrative indeterminacies. Still, the novel commends itself for the lyricism of its prose, the urgency of its momentum, and the poignancy of its depiction of an almost forgotten radical who managed to overcome terrible obstacles to try, however misguidedly, to express the rage of a generation. Very nice. Thank you. The end. Thank you. And if anybody would like to s to read this in in the you know like to actually read it, you can find it online at Lambda Book Review. And you can, read my review. Yeah, the you book can you can find on Amazon. Probably, actually, she has elsewhere. a lot of reviews on Lambda, so you can look up any of them. So. Okay. And our trivia which people may not have gotten this week. I was close <laughs> is all I can say. 1986 Supreme Court decision. Major setback for the LGBTQ civil rights. What was the decision and how was Vermont mean, deemed not to be impacted by it? It may have been the Hardwick versus Bowers decision upholding the Georgia sodomy law and Vermont had probably already decriminalized any consensual sexual practices had no bearing on us. So with <laughs> and that, that was 72, right? 1972, all of you know the statutes were repealed for criminalization of sexual practices on the contingency that they are consensual and you are the age of consent. And I just wanted to say, on, a, on, on the note of Valerie, um, <clears throat> I, re I remember reading Scum. The Scum Manifesto? Yes. I read it. It's In 1969. <laughs> it's tough reading, but it's kind of interesting. So anyway. A historical artifact, perhaps. In the tradition of uh, radicals and activists, activists and, and truth others, telling. truth tellers, remember every day to resist. resist. 